Um, so welcome everyone that is attending to our connected conversation on the Black experience in Idaho. Here with me we have Terrence and Cam. If you two just want to introduce yourself real quick. Yeah, so uh, my name's Terry Scraggins. Uh, I'm from Boise, uh, born and raised. I served in the Navy for about three and a half years. Um, just graduated from Boise State with my bachelor's in social work and I'm working in child welfare. And I would just kind of say I feel like I have a bleeding heart for social justice and social equity. Um, I've done a lot of advocating and work, uh, advocating for LGBTQ plus youth, particularly foster youth and youth of color. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and my name is Cam. I use they, them pronouns. And I've lived in Boise for, oh gosh, I think three years now. Um, I have been going to Boise State University, um, but I'm from Indianapolis, so somewhere that's a lot more like diverse than Boise. And I moved here and it was like, oh my gosh. And finding community in Boise, especially like fellow LGBTQ and fellow Black community, um, and navigating that is something that I'm really passionate about, um, making sure that incoming like first year students and people who move to Boise also have that same network. So I'm super excited to be here. Awesome. And one thing I did just want to um, talk about is if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation, just utilize the Q&A feature rather than the chat. That'd be greatly appreciated. Um, I did receive a question before this started, so I figured we, that would be a good opening. Um, someone asked if either of you can help explain the difference between the term Black and the term African American. Hmm, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, Cam, you got something while I think, or do you need a second? I can think on my feet too. <laughs> I think the only thing that I can really think of is that, like, so it's like the analogy for a square. So, like, not all African or all African African Americans are black, but not all people that are black are African Americans. That's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, and I mean, I think that I can. I think that I agree with that. Um, yeah, but I've, I've like literally never had anyone ask that question ever before. Yeah, same. So I would say that's, yeah, you did a great job of answering it. <laughs> yeah, I think also like. So it looks like we might be having some te technical difficulties at the moment. While we wait for Cam to hop back on, um, Terrence, if you wanted to just talk about your own personal experience. Um, in Idaho as part of the Black experience? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Boise, um, grew up here, and it's funny because a lot of people, I feel like that question comes up a lot, and I'm also super kind of like forthcoming in how I talk about my experience, um, but for the longest time growing up, like I was the only person of color. And so I have always, for the longest time, I thought that like I was maybe my thinking was skewed or I used to think that people would just like treat me differently, but I didn't know why. So like it almost kind of made me feel like I was making things up. And then as I started doing research and getting more like educated, I guess, um, it helped me to kind of like understand the disparities and like social inequalities mm -hmm. that people of color, of color experience. And so it actually wasn't until I got into the social work program at Boise State that I started like really understanding how serious it was. Because I don't think that in Idaho, and I mean, it may have changed a little bit since I was in elementary, junior high and high school. But uh, I think that it just isn't taught like black history just isn't taught and we te have a tendency as the state to kind of like skim over um, the importance of slavery and the importance of uh, 
racial profiling and things of that nature kind of to make it seem like, oh, there's not a problem, but there is a problem. There just aren't enough black people in Idaho to like say something about it. Or if they are, there a lot of times I feel like they are stereotyped as just being the loud black person. Um, but it's just that the the capacity or the, the avenue hasn't been out there to talk about it. Um, yeah. I don't, yeah, I think that answers the question. <laughs> Um, that actually does feed into another question that I got before this presentation, and that is, what role do you think that K through 12 education on anti-racism plays in smaller communities, um, especially throughout rural Idaho, where the communities are um, predominantly homogenous and white? Do you mean like the uh, like the lack of education, or like if anti-racism is like taught, I guess I don't understand the question. I would right. say more um, the lack of education on anti-racism. Oh, I mean, I think that it's one, I think that it definitely plays into K through 12 education. Uh, I mean, I, from, from my own personal experience as a person of color who grew up in Idaho, um, I myself struggled with my own racial identity and being told that I like wasn't acting black enough because I wasn't speaking in like stereotypical language or um, being treated differently um, literally just because of the color of my skin. I think that by not having those there's like education and like those measures in place to teach people and help them understand what's going on and like the history of African Americans is a huge, a huge thing. Um, Cam, what do you think? Sorry, I missed the first half of that question. So what role does K through 12 education on anti-racism play in smaller communities like the rural communities in Idaho where the population is mostly homogenous and mostly white? Oh gosh, I think it's like, like if students are, are being taught that like, that like it's not appropriate to talk about race in school and then they go to any other place when they're older, like, and they're taught that like, we're not supposed to talk about this, like we're, like, we're not supposed to see color, then it, like it automatically subtracts them from like a really really important conversation that needs to be had and like I so when I started at BSU I was an education major I'm not anymore just because education is really hard but like I took a diversity in the classroom like a class about teaching diversity and like we would start talking about race and everyone in the class that wasn't a person of color would automatically like try and divert the t the to like talking about gender or sexuality or, or um, disability. And I'm like, all of these things are important and you're going to have students that um, have disability are queer are um, transgender, but you're still gonna have students that are black. And so having those conversations is like really, really young is super important. And when kids don't get that, I feel like they miss out so much because like you're also missing out on the culture when you don't teach race mm -hmm. because uh, like, like coming here, it felt like I couldn't share my culture at all. And it was like, whoa, like, <laughs> I, like, I want to be able to share all the things that I learned when I was growing up. And I couldn't because like, the things that I learned and that I was taught had to do with race. And that was considered taboo, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think to kind of add to that as well, Cam, um, you kind of like speaking that and talking about that. I feel like I definitely, like my own personal self, I feel like I missed a lot, I missed out on a lot of heritage and cultural backgrounds, um, especially being raised by primarily white people, uh, that it was, I didn't really associate myself as Black um, until I would say probably like five or seven years ago, and even more so like since then just because I didn't have that knowledge and there wasn't really like, I didn't have that, I wasn't compelled to learn more 
um, just because it wasn't readily available. Not that like we should definitely do our own research and stuff, but like there really nothing was taught. <laughs> so I completely, I, I I completely agree with that. And like especially because I am very privileged in the fact that I'm from a place where there are a lot of people of color and there are a lot of black people and um, I'm also mixed, but um my mom is Mexican so I never really had to like I I didn't have whiteness to interact with and navigate and I think that I have a lot of privilege in that because I like I don't know a lot about like how white folks grow up but I know about like the way that I grew up and the way my friends grew up and we were invited to celebrate our like our culture and our heritage and it wasn't something that was so like that was so taboo and it like I recognize that I have so much privilege in that because I have friends that are here that were like that are from Idaho were adopted by white folks that like they never got the the chance to experience blackness and navigate blackness with other black folks especially because like if you're from rural Idaho it's like if you're black you're probably the only one which sucks but like that's kind of Idaho's reality yeah absolutely and Cam, a quick question for you is, do you mind talking about your own um, Black experience in Idaho, especially since yours will be different than Terrence's, especially as an outsider to Idaho moving here? Yeah. Um, so me and my friends that are not from here, we love to say that Boise State got us. They definitely tricked us with their marketing because they like, you see like Black people in their marketing, like I'm going to go to Boise State. And that's what I did. And I was like, well, like, and especially, like, I started living with white people when I was in the dorm, and I was, like, y'all don't even, like, they didn't wash their chicken before they, like, cooked it, and, like, it was little things that, like, that, that I grew up doing, and it, it was such a culture shock coming here, and, like, pretty much having to, like, code switch even when I'm in my own living space, and, like, it's so funny because I'll like get on the phone with my friends from back home and it's like a complete 180 switch. Like, I'm, like it doesn't even feel like I'm the same person. And mm -hmm. my friends will be like, why are you talking like that? I'm like, oh, like, <laughs> like, yeah. and it, I think that it's been difficult, but like the support systems that I do have, like have absolutely changed my life. Like I was a sad, alone freshman living in the dorms, staying in my dorm, like, all the time and finally um so I was in trio and my mentor was like well why don't you come to this event with me and it was taco Tuesday at Boise State's campus and I went and I was like wait a minute look at all these people of color well like where have they been hiding like mm -hmm. and um so I was sitting down I was like so scared to even like open my mouth and um at the end someone came up to me and her name was Sierra and she was the president of uh, what is now the Black Student Association. And like, she just like started having a conversation and she was like, you have to come. And it was like, oh my gosh, like there, there are more people like me. There are more people who like, also like, there's nothing wrong with having white friends, but like having black friends that you can relate to on a cultural, spiritual, like emotional level, that something that, that like a white person just can never understand was it was like bliss <laughs> and it's gotten a lot better but also like especially now like Idaho is like it's not always going to be the safest place and even now there's supposed to be a protest tonight and there are people talking about going in like Nazi gear to counter protest and it's like at, at those times I don't feel safe being black in Idaho but I think that I have the support system that like is always going to back me up if I do want to go to those things, you know? Mm -hmm. No, and that's really good that you do have that support system and the support systems like that do exist in Idaho. Um, would either of you say that events like Pride um, help representation in Idaho or Boise? Do you mean like black representation or queer representation? I would say <laughs> both, actually. Um. Um, I, 
I think that not really because when you go to Pride, it's like it's kind of just as wide as everything else. But also, like, I have a lot of qualms with the Pride that we know it today because, um, like, the like, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like the the highlight on like fetish communities that's there makes it a very unsafe environment for young queer people and, and asexual queer people who are like sex repulsed. So I have my own, like, I have my own qualms with pride, but also I think that like the community aspect could be really positive if it weren't so much a party and like community gathering, you know, mm-hmm. but also I love a good party now and then, but like, I think doing that grassroots work that pride was intended to be and what like like our queer role models intended it to be is something that like I'd want also to be focused on like during pride month yeah I would agree um in that sense of like no matter where you go in Idaho like there's not going to be a lot of people of color (laughs) So, like, in the sense of, is it representing people of color, like, queer people of color? I would say, yes, a little bit. Um, I don't think that it's it's necessarily meant for that, even though if you look at, like, historically, the LGBTQ plus community and the trans uh, individuals that have been killed and, like, kind of how everything started, um, I would say it's a good place for like just the community, but I agree with Cam and that there, it doesn't really, it really is focused on like the party aspect and maybe not so much the importance of the event itself. Okay. Have either of you experienced any racial profiling in Idaho? Always. All the time. I get follow I I can tell every time I go into Target. I don't know what the guy's name is because I don't want to look at his name tag because I will find him on Facebook. But every time I go to Target, I see him and I'm like, well, can't like might as well. I can't put my hands in my pockets. Um, I like if I have a cart, my hands can't be like in the cart. I can't take my purse into Target. It's like, but I it's so weird because I'm used to it, you know, mm-hmm. like. The fact that I can, I know his face and I like look for him. I'm like, where is he hiding this time? Like, cause I've never stolen from Target. I don't think I've ever, the only thing I've ever stolen in my life was 25 cents from my grandma. <laughs> and like, um, so like to know that like they're there, it's kind of like when I'm in it, they even do it when I'm with my white friends and I'm like, whoa, a twist. Like, and it's so funny because like I'll go and my white friends don't notice it but I do because I'm like Mm -hmm. I know what you look like bro I see you all every time I'm here I see you so absolutely yeah Yeah, it it's like we're answering the same questions Cam like the exact same way because same um I totally I've definitely been racially profiled in stores where I've been followed around but like people don't think that I realize that they're following me around but like you can tell when you're like oh I just saw you um and then I have been pulled over a couple of times where I wasn't speeding because I kind of drive just barely above the speed limit but it's also I mean it's also an interesting thing I was chatting with someone about kind of like racial profiling and like the experience of a person of color and just how they think and you don't even like in the current climate that we're in as a country with all of the things going on with uh, Black Lives Matter and things like that, um, and just social and like racial equality, I was telling someone, we were having a discussion, I was telling them like, it's really hard in Idaho specifically, but just in general, but very much in Idaho to not see just a, like a stereotypical like white person. (laughs) And I say that like very loosely um, and not think that they have some sort of like preconceived notions about you being black. And when I said that, and she herself is uh, a, a white person and she was saying to me like, you know what's crazy about that is you shouldn't have to have that double conscience. 
She's like, I don't have to think about that. I don't have to like check my thinking in like making a stereotype about them. And so that I super random like rabbit hole thing, but I just wanted to share because I'm sitting here kind of like thinking about how when I see someone on the street, I assume maybe sometimes assume that they have like certain thoughts or um, thoughts about the African-American or black or just POC community, but then I have to like check myself. Um, and I don't think, or I know, at least based off of her experience, she's like, I never even have to think about that. Um, so yeah, definitely been racially profiled. I'll get back to like the topic. <laughs> the topic but yeah. We have a question for Cam. Have you ever tried to point out the person at Target to your white friends? Oh, all the time. Places? Every time, I'm, like if I'm in with a different white person at Target, and, like, if I see him, I'm like, oh, hey, he followed me around every time that I'm here. I'm just, they're like, oh, no, like, you're probably just being dramatic. I'm like, and then they like, I'm like, there he is. Like, I'll point him out. And they're like, wait, does he do this every time you're here? I'm like, yes. Like, I can't even imagine what he does around someone that's darker than me. Like, and it's like, I always try and like point things out, especially mm -hmm. like, because Terry, I, pro I know you probably feel this like when you're just anywhere and there's the white person that's like, is that really a black person in Idaho? Like just, just looking and you're like, I'm here, I'm real. <laughs> like, like I, I point out things like that to them too. I'm like. Especially <laughs> in the more rural parts <laughs> of like Idaho. Like I went up to Coeur d'Alene. Oh my gosh. That was a oh. scary experience. <laughs> yeah. See, I like, um, I go to like my I have family in Ontario and I'll go like see them and I like stop somewhere in Ontario and people like there are a lot more people of color in Ontario but there are not that many like black folks and so I'll go to like the gas station and people like turn their heads because Ontario is also a really small town so like you're used to seeing the same people and it's like a different person and they're black what is going on you know um, Terrence, how did your experience in the military expand your knowledge of, um, Black issues after coming from Idaho? Um, I can say that I, I realized that there were a lot more Black people. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can also say that I I think at least based on like what I experienced and like how I saw other people um, kind of like function in the military that racism is just as rampant in the military as it is in general society. Um, I saw a lot of people do of color do a lot of work and not get recognized for it. And I'm not even just talking about like black or African American people. Um, but I mean, it also, I think that it also helped me to understand, like, there were a lot of people of color that I met and I had relationships that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, and so I, I'm thankful for that. Uh, but I would say that just based off my own personal experience serving the Navy, there's the same, the same problems that we have as a country are just as intense if not maybe more compounded um in the military based off of my own experience but um yeah i tend to look on the positive side so i think overall i had a good experience but i definitely experienced like my own personal um kind of like biases like towards people and their biases towards me um serving even though i felt like i constantly worked the hardest that I possibly could have, but didn't get a whole lot of recognition. Not that I'm looking for that, but yeah. I'd say it's about the same. <laughs> um, Cam, did, was there anything that the locals of Boise um, did to make you feel welcome when you actually moved to Boise after realizing that Bo Boise as a city is not as diverse as you initially thought? I don't think. Boise as a whole did and I don't really think that Boise State did 
I think that it was those communities who have had those same experiences and like want to help people have the best time possible and have the most successful career at Boise State that did. Like, um, uh, I saw like when we started, one of my mentors from Trio, Anna, is like in the in this meeting, but like if it weren't for her, I would not have gotten out of my shell as much as I did. And as like a fellow Latina person, she like did the work for me to be involved in so many things. And so did my other mentor, Adriana, like they did that work so that I like, cause after my first semester, I was like, I can't do this anymore. Like I have to get out of here. And my mom was like, listen, we at least have to do a full year. And I was like, okay. And when I came back, like they were such a big support system, but I don't think that like, Boise as a whole has been because they're like Boise has so much learning to do from what and even from when I've been here there has been growth but like Boise State has been on like been on track to become um, a Latina serving institution and I don't think that Boise State does enough for their students and does enough for especially for their like students that speak predominantly Spanish to actually have that title because you can have the numbers, but are you actually providing the resources that are needed for those students? And like wholeheartedly, I can't say that Boise State does. They've done a lot of work, but I don't think that they're there yet. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of resources, what do both of you think could happen in Idaho to further diversity education? Um, and then also kind of a two-pronged question, what were your experiences with teachers throughout your K through 12 education? I know camp for you will be different. Um, and were you adequately supported by your teachers and counselors with diversity? Um, so in terms of, I totally missed like the very last part of the question, but I got the first couple parts. So you can just let me know. Um, in terms of like K through 12 and my experience, um, I definitely felt like I was treated differently when I was younger, um, like kindergarten, first grade, um, just based on like the way that I was reprimanded or like disciplined in comparison to like my peers. Um, I also have my own, I have lots of intersectionality, so I had like my own stuff going on with my family and stuff too. Uh, but overall, I think that I had a pretty good experience. Um, I did have one experience w in sixth grade uh, where I could never like point it out openly, but I definitely felt like I was discriminated against and I had a teacher that actually threatened to like fail me. Uh, based off of like handwriting and I'm like I feel like that's ex like excessive I don't know um I forget what the other question was in terms of oh um how to further diversity education like do you have any recommendations or thoughts? yeah so to like I think that to a diversify education like some of the best things that we could do as a community is if they're willing kind of like recruit or ask more people of color i know there's not a lot idaho but like ask people of like more people of color if they're interested in like their own uh experiences and like being stakeholders and also i think that we just need to amp up the education honestly for just teachers and just people in general i i really don't think that a lot I truly, from the bottom of my heart, don't think that a lot of people are inherently racism, inherently racist. There are a few. Um, there are some people, but I truly think that it's it's what a lot of people think. The way that they think and their processes, I think they have a like they're thinking a certain way for a reason. And so I think if we can educate and like provide more resources as to like the historical background that we could move mountains. But I don't think that there's the support. I don't think that there's the funding, not to mention teachers don't get paid enough as it is. 
like in this current day and age and we just are facing another huge budget cut so I guess I don't really like, have a legitimate answer but those would be like dream answers <laughs> Yeah, and I think mine was, like, super different because, like, one of the first teachers that I had was a Black woman, and, like, she, like, I was always in like, really big goody, goody two-shoes because I was terrified of, like, because teachers can punish me all they want, but nothing is more scary than, like, disappointing my mom, <laughs> and not even, like, it's not, like, oh, like, I'm going to have, like, physical repercussions, but, like, just knowing that my mom's going to be disappointed is, like, ooh, but, like, my first, like, my first teachers were Black, and they, like, they had gone, like, they know what it's like to be Black, and, like, going into, like, elementary school, I didn't really have those, like, a lot of the teachers in my school were Black as well, um, except, like, I distinctly remember one of the teachers that I had, um, like, I think that she just needed, like, a break, because she would just, like, scream at all the black kids, and, like, it was, like, it was scary, and it was hard to, like, deal with, but, like, then going in, like, the next year, the teacher I had, um, he was the first male teacher I had, but not the first black teacher I had, and I remember, like, telling my mom, I was like, he's going to be mean, like, I'm going to have a boy teacher, and I don't want it, and this was fourth grade, and I heard from him the other day, like, he was probably one of the biggest positive impacts in my life, like, education-wise, and just, like, seeing how much he cared about students, like, and how much effort that he put in, that's one of the reasons I wanted to be an educator, um, and, like, even going into high school, like, we, so my high school had four different principals and two of the four principals that we had were black and that like there were always black folks in leadership, black teachers that I had um, that were supportive and like my, um, I can't remember her name for the life of me, but my counselor in middle school is one of the reasons that like me and my mom have such like a healthy relationship talking about like depression and anxiety and all those positive influences that I had, like, made me so confident in myself and my blackness that when I came to Voices State, I was like, I can do this. Like, like, nothing is going to diminish my blackness because at the end of the day, people are going to look at me and say, that person is black and that's never going to change. And I don't want that to change because I love who I am. I love that I have been given the opportunities that I have but at the same time, like, like my experiences from Terry are going to be completely different because, like, where I'm from is predominantly people of color, and also like I like I can't even imagine what it's like doing school here because I like did service learning in K in like K through twelve, and it was like it was terrifying. I was like, oh my gosh, I got to get out of here. Like, it's it's scary to be in such a different place that has so much less funding than what I grew up with. Like seeing the difference and seeing like how, like how students are treated, like it, as much as I want to like be in that system to make a difference, like I, like I give so, so, so much credit to educators and counselors and social workers because it's such hard work to be a child support system and then like you have to send send them home and you don't know what happens like i can't even begin to imagine how difficult that is and like especially like going back and talking to the teachers that i had and like knowing like the impact that they had on me but also like hearing the impact that i had on them is like like i didn't realize that even when i was little i had this much power you know mm -hmm. and i wish that is something that like every kid learns is that you could have so so much power and ability to to change the world and I know that sounds like cliche and corny but like every kid does and they just need to be steered in that right direction to know that they that they can do so much and like it starts when you're in school and when you're like in those formative years of getting love and support and education like just how much can change like the way you grow up I know I kind of just went on a tangent but 
education is something that I'm like really, really passionate about. You still stayed on topic. You didn't go off topic. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> fine. Um, no, that's really, I think that does ring true for a lot of people. You just said, Cam. Um, do you, either of you have any examples of a white person or someone who's like, identifying and attempting to be an ally, doing more harm than good. Um, so actually recently there was someone that was involved in like the Black Lives Matter protest and like they were like, I don't want to say any names because it like, I don't want to like get anybody in trouble because I had a conversation with this person, but like they were trying to measure the way that people of color show up for Black Lives Matter events. And like, for me, I like, it's very hard for me to look at as someone who is black and queer. And like, I have black family and a black nephew knowing that like, I don't want to watch one of those videos one day and it be like someone that I care about. And just knowing that like, every time you see one of those videos, it's someone that someone cares about and like, they were sharing videos of like black people being killed by police and like black people being beat up by police and like talking about the way that people of color um show up for these events not realizing the harm and the safety levels like in Boise it's not as safe to come to these events as much as like people want to but like people are getting arrested for walking down the street and it's not just black people and so like trying to police the way that black folks can show up right now and what and the capacity that black folks have like it's really a person-to-person -person basis because I know black folks that are like yeah let's do this like let's burn stuff down and I'm like I like I don't have the emotional energy for this and it's really like and Terry might be like yeah let's go or Terry might be like maybe sometimes but it's not it really just depends because on top of like all this stuff happening we still have to deal with like microaggressions on a daily basis, like still trying to navigate black identity because it's something that is forever evolving and like continually having to like think about how you're going to show up and how you're going to support your community, but also like taking care of yourself because that's not something that black people are taught to do. Like self-care is such, such, such a big part of activism that gets overlooked because like we like you i mean like i was We're doing too busy research. fighting yeah and like and i did surviving. i was doing i was doing research and i saw that like something like 50 percent of uh residents that are going to be doctors and i think it was like 2017 didn't think that black people could feel pain like how, think about how many people feel that not just doctors but like just people in general like because we're feeling it every day because that person in those videos could be your brother, your sister, your cousin, like someone that you know, and you're still expected to show up and also grieve and do self care. And it just becomes a juggling act that white people have expectations of when it's not the same grieving and pain that black folks are experiencing when stuff like this happens. Yeah, I agree, and I think to add to that, um, and to answer your question, Cam, I totally am like on the fence, it depends on the day, because I 100% agree. Sometimes I'm like, this, I have to, I'm like held by a standard as a social worker, like code of ethics, and what I believe, and the social work kind of like expectation is to advocate for those within marginalized and disenfranchised communities, but on that same note, I'm like, I also have to be careful with what I say and what I do because I need to keep my job. <laughs> so it's kind of like that double-edged sword. And then to kind of answer the question of um, if I've experienced like a person, like a white person do more harm than like good, I think it's, I don't think it was ever intentional, but I've had like many close friends that, and I think it's a microaggression. I don't think it's something that's like intentional, but 
um, just not speaking up in instances where I feel like I could use like a little bit of help um, with things being said, whether it's jokingly or serious. Um, so in that sense, I think that I could speak to that, but I completely agree with like the going to protests and stuff. People are like, well, there's no one here that, or not that many people here of color where you're like, okay, but like the current day that we live in and the current situation and the climate, it doesn't feel good. You have, just like you were saying, Cam, you have to worry about self-care. You have to worry about hearing names recited of people that have lost their lives. You have people posting stuff on Facebook and every other me like social media platform about the the trauma that our people are going through and it's not it's just a lot to take in and then on top of that microaggressions and it's, the list just keeps going on so yeah i like i appreciate that you pointed that out and also like i like and on top of like all that stuff people are expecting you to like educate them and i'm like I'm tired. I need to go to bed. Like I just got off of work yes. and I, it's like people are expecting you to continuously do free labor without like considering like anything else that's going on in your life. And I'm like, no, like someone asked me to tell them why dreads on people who aren't black is a bad thing. And I'm like, here's my Venmo. If you're not going to say anything, I'm, I don't have the energy to have this conversation because yes. like at the end of the day, like if you're going to pay for a textbook, if you're going to pay for, to like, go to see a TED talk, like, why is my time and effort and energy any less worth any of that? Because if it's because I don't have a bachelor's degree, then that's, like, classes, and, like, let's unpack yeah. that, but, like, there are so many levels to, like, well-meaning white people that it's, like, yeah, and even, you know, like, people, even, like, people saying, hey, are, like, when the riots and protests started, and they were, like, real intense, so many people reached out to me and were like, are you okay? How are you feeling? And I'm like, even that's exhausting because I have to take the time to respond to every single person that's like, are you okay? How are you feeling? So, yes. <laughs> and like, so I worked at the Gender Equity Center for the last two years and literally like, I love the staff there so much because they've reached out to me when all this stuff happened, not trying to assuage their white guilt, but to like, like say like, hey, if you need me, I'm here for you. Like, don't feel like I, like you have to respond to me, but know that like, I'm here for you when I see you and I, and I care about you. And that like, that means so much to have people that are like, Hey, I just want to make sure you're good. And like, I even had white people that I know, they didn't even reach out to me. They just sent me money. And I was like, you just like bought me dinner. And I'm not like, and like, it made me think, know that like, you're thinking about me. And that's something that like, like it's the little things that like white people do not to just assuage their guilt, but to actually let you know that they're there and they appreciate you and they don't want you to continue to do free labor for them. Yeah, I think that ties back to our conversation last week where Gabby mentioned about LGBTQIA um, education and how a lot of people are going to these members of the community asking these questions, expecting a response for free, where there is that emotional toll that it does take, especially when it's question after question. Um, now, talking about intersectionality, which would you have to say is harder for each of you being a person of color or being part of the LGBTQ community within Boise? I think if like I had to choose, I would say being black is harder but I don't get to exist one without the other. Mm -hmm. And like, both are like, both can be really difficult, but both are parts about myself that I love and like, I'm going to continue loving. And like, um, I think that even this question, like it can be like, like we shouldn't be asking which is harder. We should be asking what's difficult about both of them together. Cause like, I don't get to like, it, I don't get to exist one without, one without the other, like I yeah, said. Yeah, you can't turn one off. Yeah, and I, I definitely agree, um, but I think, 
I don't know. That's a really hard question to answer. Yeah. I definitely think that they kind of like are one and the same, but then I throw in like, I was just talking with someone. I had like a, a chat with them earlier talking about the different intersections of people and they work for an organization that kind of like promotes social justice and like immigration and LGBTQ and like people of color and I guess for me, I don't know if I could even really answer that question because I would say it was more difficult being a person that grew up in severe poverty first before I could even associate or identify with being black or being gay. So, but to actually answer the question wholeheartedly, if I had to pick one or the other, I would say definitely being a person of color is more difficult um, because I think that as a culture, we're becoming a little bit more aggressive in terms of like LGBTQ um, there's still so far to go but uh, I would say I'm more uncomfortable if I'm like in the store being a person of color versus being gay because I can't hide my skin color not that I'm saying I ever try to hide that I'm gay anymore I used to but don't anymore um, but you can't you literally can't hide this characteristic as a person so I probably would have to go with that. And like also, it's so like weird to see like how other parts of my identity intersect. Like because I also grew up like in poverty, but because my my mother and um, my stepfather are both Mexican, people don't attribute my like poverty level to them because they're not black. And also like even like going through school when I started to have like white teachers they would like assume that I was not doing work or I wasn't doing things because I was lazy because I'm black like that's a very common stereotype that black folks are lazy but it was because I had undiagnosed ADD, ADHD and anxiety and depression that just made me not want to do things and it's so interesting to see like all those intersections of different parts of my identity aside from like being black and being queer. Um, doo -doo -doo. So there is a movement about taking the knee. How do you both personally, since it is hard to make a blanket statement about people of color and their opinions, how do you feel about white people taking the knee? Does it come across to you as support or something else? I have to ask a question super quick before either of us answer this. Are we talking taking a knee for like the national anthem or are we talking taking me taking a knee as in like reference to George Floyd? That I don't know so I will give the person a chance to clarify that. If you don't mind sending that clarification in the chat that would be lovely. We'll circle back to that. Oh the national anthem? Um, for me, it, like, there are layers to it because, like, there was um, folks in, I think, I think it was, like, the House of Representatives or the Senate or something that they, like, took a knee while wearing, like, kente cloth, and I was like, oh my gosh, like, this is so performative, but, like, if you're doing it in the way that, like, Colin Kaepernick did, in talking to veterans and like seeing the best way to like do it and he did it in a way that was peacefully protesting it it's very different i think that like if you're taking a knee and putting your fist up and you're like that's it i my activism is done for the year like like let's let's investigate that and see like what better ways you can use your privilege to actually like support people like and that that's like that's how I felt about like the Blackout Tuesday thing, where like people who had never said the words Black Lives Matter posted their little black square and then continued to like partake in capitalism, partake in like things that continue like going outside without their masks on, things that continually and like hurt people of color disproportionately. It's like, okay, like I can like it's gotten pretty easy to like I don't want to say see through because like. Again, there are people who mean well, but like 
I don't get to be surface, I like, like, they can have like surface level activism, but the surface that people see on me is black. And so that never changes. Yeah. And I think as, oh, it's funny that someone asked this question because I can't tell you how many times I have seen it show up on my feed somewhere. Um, especially like serving in the Navy, I have had so many people that feel different on different ends. But I would say more often than like not, even people that I've served with that have been like, that have seen that or ha it's come up in discussion, they're like, I don't care. Like the, in, in the sense of like, this is America, we're supposed to be a free country. So if you don't want like, people are signing the dotted line to serve our country and they don't care about whether or not someone is standing or kneeling because that's their right. But I mean, I've also gotten into like a lot of uh, dialogue and conversations with people about the way that they feel about it. So from like that aspect, I personally don't care. But from like a person like of color aspect, like wearing multiple hats, I also think that it is a way to kind of like speak out, but I'm not, I, I still don't have like, I'm not against it. I think that it's, I personally think that it's fine if someone chooses to kneel for the national anthem. But I also agree with Cam in that that shouldn't be all that people are doing. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend? Um, we have a, an attendee that would like to diversify their social media and also diversify their reading. So do you, either of you have go-to resources on how to broaden their perspective on social media um, such as who they should be following on Instagram specifically. And then also authors that they might not have heard of, but can help inform understanding specifically. Don't follow Candace Owens. That's what I can say. Yes. <laughs> like y'all are welcome to do you, but like I'm telling you right now from my, like from my personal opinion, she has a, like, she's very intelligent, but that's like, I would say that's a don't. Um, in terms of like things to do, Cam, do you have some? Um, I think, okay, this is very like base level, but follow Lizzo. Because to see someone who is plus size and black doing their thing and shutting down people who are like, well, you're fat, so you're not healthy. And then like people literally watching her do like these dance moves that they couldn't you do in a thousand years. Like I love Lizzo and I love her so much. Um, but even not just like black folks, um, Virgie Tovar is amazing. I, um, I also like, she writes like articles. I don't, I don't know if she's written a book, but if she did, I would read it. Um, oh gosh. Um, if well, you one that are I, trying oh. to get, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to throw one in because I actually had to read it for one of my social work classes, The Jim Crow Era. Super good book. It is, it comes from like a, a different perspective, but that's super informational. Keep going. Um, if you're trying to get like young adults to like get in, The Hate You Give is a great book. It's a lot better than the movie. Um, um, I, oh, I can't think of her name. Angela Davis. Um, Ijeoma Oluo wrote, um, uh, so you want to talk about race. I've been reading a book called uh, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, um, Reclaiming Our, Faith, Our Space by Feminista Jones. Um, oh gosh, there are so many. <laughs> I don't, I never use Instagram because like I said, it's just like performative activism, a black person getting murdered. <laughs> And like, that's kind of what my feed is right now, but yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you can definitely follow BLM Boise. I know Black Lives Matter Boise has a page. Um, Inclusive Idaho recently was started. 
and also uh, on like BuzzFeed, if anyone is ever really interested in like kind of checking their privilege, whether it be white or just privilege in general, BuzzFeed has a really awesome um, privilege test. It's like a hundred questions and then it like lets you know your experience based on how you answer those questions and like what level of privilege you have. I took that and I learned some things too about my own self, so. Uh, what? Oh, sorry. Go go for it, Cam. Um, I can't think of what. It's like the something. There's a number. The something frame of colorblind colorblind racism. Um, I can't think of who wrote it either. But um, also, like if you're just starting out and you want to know like how is a white person to come into these spaces, read Robin DiAngelo. Her like, I read White Fragility and I like skimmed through. Um, what does it mean to be white? Because I was doing a program through the Gender Equity Center um, where we were talking about white privilege and it like it has some really good keys that I wish that like white folks coming into predominantly POC spaces would read and like understand before coming in with like so much privilege. And I really like her writing style, even though Robin D'Angelo is, isn't a person of color. No, thank you for all those resources. Um, continuing with resources, what advice would you give to a junior high or high school student who is currently experiencing racism at a school, but they don't want to tell anyone due to a fear of retaliation due to the lack of diversity? Mm. Uh, that's a big one to unpack. That's a really like, layered question because one like are you like are you safe in the situation yeah. that you're like because from what I've learned from people who go to school here like a lot of the schools that they go to are like a lot of people that went to school in Idaho like all those schools are predominantly white and just like like what support systems do you have like yes like listen I've been seeing all these people on Twitter that are like like if you're being racist on like in public that they're like okay well let's talk to your employer and I think that they're like like it it's just so like like it's so layered because one like it it can't be like a healthy situation if you like are going somewhere to receive an education and you're being discriminated against but also like my main thing is like are you safe like how can we get you out of that situation? You yeah, know? that's the first place that my mind went to was, do you feel safe? Even though, I mean, and there's a difference between like physically safe and like emotionally safe, for sure. But like, do you feel physically safe? What kind of support system do you have? Do you have someone that you can like speak to? And I mean, I know that we've come a long ways as well in terms of like counseling and mental health. But especially as, like, being someone that, like, grew up in that <laughs> and, like, feeling like I experienced things in maybe a different light, um, it's not bad to, like, even if it's not, like, a licensed professional, but just having someone that you can talk to about and unpack those experiences. Because I uh, completely understand and agree that it's important to have uh, strong support systems and there's only so much that we can do and that sounds awful because it shouldn't be that way um, but sometimes you have to internally build up um, that wall I guess of safety if you're not getting it from other avenues so having like someone you can talk to and a support system if you don't feel safe then I think by all means that it should be reported but if you don't feel comfortable having someone that can be an ear for you or help provide some sort of advice or guidance. Yeah, and like, I have a lot of time on my hands right now. So like, if you need some support, like I think a lot of the posts that we put out have my Instagram on them and I check my DMs pretty regularly just in case. And if like, you need someone to like reach out to your school, I like, I, like I said, I have a lot of times on my hands and like, I like, I definitely have time to like reach out because especially like in school like 
school is the one place that you deserve to feel safe. Like you mm-hmm. have to be there for so long and for so many hours every day. Like, and especially like if it's a student that needs to be like learning better or a teacher that, that's getting paid and then is, and is then not providing equal um, or equitable support and education to their students, like that's definitely something that needs to be addressed on a higher level. And unfortunately, we are running low on time, so I will be able to ask one more question, but um, I will make sure Cam's contact info is on our website. That way people can reach out to you as well as Terry. Um, Going back to the beginning with Idaho being predominantly white, um, some people do believe in Idaho that racism isn't a problem within the state. How do you both perceive that as an issue and how that experience within Idaho would be different than such as the South or the East Coast, where there are larger proportions of people of color? Ooh. That's like... I know that's another oh. one to end on. I can like, totally answer. Okay, go ahead, Terry. <laughs> because about a year ago, I actually posted an experience that I had um, at Winco, some, I experienced racism. That's, I'll leave it at that because we're short on time. Um, and I posted it in this Boise page, Boise Bench Dwellers, ex- like kind of like explaining my experience and just saying, hey, everyone needs to speak up. There were a lot of people that said race, it didn't used to be like this. I'm sorry you experienced that. And I said, you know, born and raised here, I assure you it has been here. Um, and a lot of people backed me. Um, what I can say is that I, I truly think that people that don't think there's a problem with racism or people that don't think that it's an issue, they are in circles in which they are not exposed to it. But I can tell you that people of color, it is definitely a real problem. And it is certainly a problem today, especially considering the time that we're in. And I just encourage those people that don't think racism is a thing in Idaho to do a little bit more research and get more educated because it is. And I will say that till I'm blue in the face, but there's my two cents. It's all you can. Yeah, I definitely agree. Like if, if one, I like met people of color who are like, Oh, I don't experience racism. And then they do like research and education because they haven't had to do that before. And they're like, wait, these people were like being racist towards me and I didn't realize it because I've had to block it out for so long. And like, just like knowing that like, Idaho is somewhere that where, from what I've learned and from what people have told me is that it's a place where people feel like they have to assimilate just to feel safe and just to feel welcome. And it continues that idea that like, black people are so ghetto and ranch and that we are just so other and just like taking a second to realize that like as like as much as people hate to hear this all white people are racist and you have to do the work to undo that whether you're like overtly racist or you have racist biases like you have to work through that and it sucks at first and it's uncomfortable but i promise you it's 1000% more com- uncomfortable and unsafe being a black person in idaho and it just takes reading and education, watching TED Talks to actually unpack all of that and, and then actually be able to provide equitable services at your job, um, equitably hire, equitably, equitably provide housing. And like it all starts with individual and you can take that to your team, to your supervisor and you like using your privilege your white privilege, your straight privilege, your cis privilege, your able body privilege is something that everyone needs to do um, to make sure that everyone in the room is heard, not just black folks. Yeah, and also and, recognizing oh. that we, like, no matter where you are in, in Idaho, you are on indigenous land. Like, I, I, like it doesn't matter if you're in Coeur d'Alene or in Idaho Falls, we're all on indigenous land and recognizing that there are people who are still being left out of the conversation. Yeah, and two seconds, too, and then I'll be done um, to kind of echo what you said, Cam, in terms of, like, all white people are racist. I will tell you right now, even myself, 
growing up in Idaho, I didn't even know I was black until I was four. And I have had my own internalized racism that I've had to deal with. So keep that, like, just for everyone watching, like, keep that in mind, too. Like, if when you're speaking with people of color, because it's not, it isn't just white people. Like, I feel like our culture has done such a good job overall to kind of, like, glamorize people, POCs, like, struggles and challenges that it's, it's so much more than that. But. Well, I just want to say thank you to both of you for a very informative and a very timely conversation. And thank you to everyone who stuck it out till the end.